Thank you for joining us today as we explore a day in the life of a community organisation. Uh, the Polaron team would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians throughout Australia and their continued connection to land, sea and the community. Uh, next slide. I'd like to start with the agenda. We'll firstly introduce our panellists and hear from Polaron's founder before moving to our case study, panel discussion and finally finishing off with the Q&A. Just a reminder that, this, uh, that we will be answering all your questions and comments during the Q&A section at the end of this webinar. So please leave your questions in the comments section throughout. Um, first off, I would like to introduce Francie Bulgett, the CEO of Australian Croatian Community Services. Francie holds a Bachelor of Languages, Diploma of Teaching and a NADI qualification as an interpreter and translator. Welcome Francie. Next up, I would like to introduce Basia Quadiri. He is the founder and CEO of Bacta Community Organization. Basia is a highly accomplished and respected Afghan poet, writer, and community advocate. He has dedicated his life to promoting harmony, multiculturalism, and acceptance. Wonderful to have you, Basia. I would also like to introduce our very own Carla Fuentes. She is the head of community engagement at Polaron Language Services and offers the unique perspective of working directly with community organizations. Wonderful to have you as well, Carla. Um, next up, I would also like to give a warm, uh, warm welcome to Eva Hussein, the founder and director of Polaron Language Services. Eva is, uh, Eva is a certified translator, interpreter, and a NADI examiner. Now, Eva, could you tell me a bit more about Polaron and the work we do with community organizations? Thank you, Angelo. Um... Look, um, we do a lot of translating work uh, where communities get, en get engaged uh, from the very beginning of the process. So we call that community-led or um, community-designed translations. Um, we do that because we know that um, to develop information for, um, uh, for people who may um, struggle with things like literacy, um, they might have um, hearing issues or they might um, need assistance with visual aids. It's really important to develop information in a way that they can understand. So when we develop translations, uh, I say that all the time, it's not so that we can put it up on a wall. Uh, it's more about um, making sure that uh, the information is accessible. So we're very passionate about um, working with communities to develop translation. Yeah, amazing. Um, okay, now I'd like to uh, pass it over to Francie, um, who's going to give a little uh, presentation for us that she has prepared. Francie, how are you today? Thank you, Angela. Uh, well, and yourself? Oh, very well. Always well, Francie. Um, all right, we'll go to your slides. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the invitation and for allowing me to introduce you to X, as we call it, Australian Croatian Community Services. I am uh, Franci Bulyat, the CEO. Thank you. Next slide. Yes, um, Australian Croatian Community Services, or X, as I will refer to in, um, in my talk, uh, were established uh, 40 years ago. First grant was received, first small grant for a part-time worker was received back in 1982. So we've come a long way and crucial to our longevity and success uh, has been the ability for us to grow and change as the community needs change. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, I'd like to present uh, X, uh, who we are and, and what we do in the next slides. And the photos you will see are photos of our clients and staff alike. Thank you. So I will talk a bit about uh, people, services, and also at the end, I will um, do some important reflections. Uh, we uh, we run from three offices, uh, one's in Footscray, one in Dandenong, and one in Geelong. Next slide. As a um, community services organization, not-for-profit, public benevolent institution and charity, we uh, we have members, a pool of members uh, who elect a board of directors. 
And then we have also staff, paid staff and volunteers. I always say people are our greatest assets and these are, these are the numbers of staff. So we have 17 registered members. Uh, we, uh, there are six directors on the board as serving in voluntary capacity, 29 office staff, including uh, two tutors, uh, three assistants, and cooks in the social, two cooks in social support groups, 46 direct care workers, and 25 registered volunteers. Thank you. Moving on. The numbers here show our client, current client base. Uh, 262 recipients of home care packages program and two private services clients, 114 in uh, social support groups, 61 recipients of the basic support through Commonwealth Home Support Program. We also run a community visitors scheme program uh, and have 13, 32 residential and 15 uh, home care packages clients serving through that program. Uh, we run a fee for service Croatian language classes and uh, pre accredited. Uh, classes through adult community and further education programs. So a substantial number of students there. Thank you. Moving on. Uh, can you go back? Yes, thank you. Um, this is how we are structured. We are structured around three service delivery groups and plus support. Uh, our main, uh, main, pro main one is comprehensive support at home. So for complex, complex uh, needs of uh, care recipients and that's home care packages program and private services. We also have uh, entry level home and community support. We run uh, domestic assistance, social support, individual and transport services and run social support groups. Currently we have um, seven of them throughout uh, metropolitan Melbourne. Uh, although very small portion of our funding, we're nevertheless very proud of education and other programs or projects area. We run computer and digital literacy classes. And like I said, fee for service Croatian language classes and also many one-off projects. Currently we are, we have undertaken a research project on uh, needs of Croatian community in Victoria. So it will be exciting once the report comes, comes out. Under organizational support, uh, there is myself, uh, finance department, manager quality and operations, clinical care and human resources. And we also have a couple of assistants. Thank you. This slide was just to show how we have grown. This is our five year overview, so significant, significant growth in, uh, in all areas, basically. Thank you. Moving on. Next, uh, thank you. I couldn't resist. I have put in this slide here uh, showing uh, the, um, the outcome of quality review that we had in, um, in October. So every three years, HK Quality and Safety Commission uh, undertakes a quality review of approved service providers. We just had one in February, and uh, I'm very proud to say that we have passed all standards and all, all eight standards and all 42 requirements. So uh, an amazing achievement for the whole team. Thank you. in pictures, so pictures uh, speak thousand words, as we say. So just uh, the next few, few slides will be the photos of what we've done. This is a famous Croatian singer, and uh, he had a concert on Zoom for us, for the groups, and this is us listening to him and enjoying it. Thank you. Moving on. Valentine's Day at St. Albans Park. Begonia Fest, yes, just um, our social support group having having fun and they like to take photos and have lasting memories of, of their outings. Begonia Festival in Ballarat. Yeah, next one. Mini golf, very active. Mini golf in Bandura, playing golf in Bandura. 
next out one uh, one of the outings in uh, Sunshine Park. Coffee and cake in reservoir. So a lot of uh, a lot of out and about for a social support group. Really, an amazing way to uh, to get connected at this age. Uh, this is our education program and um, celebratory dinners or um, certificate presentations for uh, adult community and further education classes and also Croatian Croatian language program. Yeah, moving on. Thank you. The next few slides I'd like to reflect on what we are up to. So COVID as we know, is pretty much present. Our primary focus has always been health and safety of both clients and staff. So we are very, very big on implementation of infection prevention and control measures. We are continuing with the well-being initiatives and do regular and up-to-date communications to both staff and, and our clients. Next. We've had uh, a lot of family forum online information sessions with uh, with carers, family representatives, and clients if they were able to be there. Information is worth of gold, as you know, so we are very, very much on sharing knowledge and up-to-date information. As for in internal processes, we have we have had the documentation and processes review, so uh, staff better understands demand for clinical uh, services and we have also implemented uh, data register so data is crucial with no data we can't take any any measures to improve so we are very big on on data thank you uh we we have uh but well we have initiated this um innovative approach uh we were able to receive uh, or to change the intent of uh, adult further uh, adult further education program grant and turn it into a specific course which we called work systems and communication uh, aimed at our internal frontline staff direct care workers so uh, department of education and training was very happy to approve our initiative so we turned uh, computer and digital literacy classes into a very, very specific course for our internal staff. So they can uh, they can gain a better knowledge and understanding of what is required and therefore better participate in, uh, in work activities. Thank you. Uh, currently, we are doing another internal programs restructure to ensure effective delivery and organizational objectives developing also we are also developing workforce capability planning and development framework and just completed a digital transformation strategy uh, another uh, important or big piece of news is that we are expanding operations interstate uh, we have been approached by a Croatian community in New South Wales to commenced operations as uh, home care packages approved provider day. So we are seriously looking into it and we'll, we'll be starting in, a, in the next couple of months. Thank you. Uh, challenges, there are many. Um, HK reform. Uh, there is a lot, there are a lot of changes that we are encountering as we speak and there are lots coming, uh, coming our way. Uh, only uh, only this week we learned that um, home uh, in, in home support program will not go ahead uh, on July 1, 2024 as originally planned. They have extended it for one year. So it will now start in July 2025, which will give us a bit more time to adjust. So basically, Two big programs, home care packages and Commonwealth Home Support Program will, for us, will, will become one. So a new world in 2025. Interim, we are expecting a new HK Act, which will come out in, um, in the second half of 2024. 
and also new HK quality and safety standards. So uh, a lot of new, a lot of new things coming up. Thank you. Uh, workforce shortages. I've, I I thought I'd put a bit of a statistic here. I don't know whether you are aware, but there are skill uh, workforce uh, shortages in every industry. I'd say we all feel our own and. Um, Age care is in, in crisis in terms of uh, workforce shortages. Frontline show, uh, front staff like direct care workers, but also professional, professionals in the age care industry like your enrolled nurses, registered nurses, operations managers, and, and the like. Yeah. Next slide. So we are actively seeking direct care workers to support uh, elderly people in their homes. By pro these are the services that we provide, personal care, domestic assistance, meal preparation, transport, respite, and other services. Qualifications that uh, are required are Certificate 3 in HK or Certificate 3 in individual support. However, we employ people with no certificate and uh, heavily assist them to obtain qualifications. So we are very, very supportive of our staff. Uh, I'd like to use this opportunity and, um, and share this. So if anyone is interested or knows someone that could be interested in getting a, a job in the industry with us, they are very, very welcome to, to let us know. So uh, cu currently we are paying a permanent uh, staff like anywhere between 28 and 32 dollars per hour. This is a figure for permanent permanent staff. Uh, casual casuals receive 25% loading on top of it. Uh, we will be increasing this figure by 15% coming uh, July 1 as per Fair Work Commission decision. Uh, as a charity and public benevolent institution, we salary package. So there is a, an option of additional tax-free amount of $16,500. I'm proud of a great working and flexible environment we, we provide. And um, we are also very big on support and training, upskilling, professional development, and all that. Thank you. Well, that I finished. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Francie. That was wonderful. Um, we're just going to move on to the panel discussion. So I will pass it over to Eva as the moderator. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Francie. And uh, you and I have known each other for quite some years. And I know that um, you're one of those people that's truly passionate about the work you do. Um, and your organization has been uh, around for some some years, probably close to 45 um, soon. Um, and I, I guess your um, space um, is a little bit different than um, an organization um, that's newer, like uh, Basia. So I was, what I was going to ask um, is Basia to, for him to turn his camera on and tell us just very br briefly about um, his work, because I think um, it's fair to say that um, your organization this year is a little bit newer than Francis serving the Croatian communities and our other communities, as, of course. Um, so tell us just briefly, um, what does your organization do? Mm -hmm. Well, um, yes, that's true. Um, but the community organization established in 2017 with a vision of uh, bringing the community together, primarily the Afghan community, as you know, um, Afghans come from a very diverse background um, and bringing them together, we had a strategy to, um, uh, to use uh, towards the uh, community's activities to bring all the ethnicities under one umbrella. And that was um, going secular, so removing the religious part and as well as the political opinion and ideologies uh, to provide a safe platform for everyone that can see themselves within the organization. We provide a wide range of services in the community um, that includes um, activities and uh, workshops, uh, focuses on family and domestic violence, uh, mental health, 
um, employment, um, youth activities, um, drug abuse, elder abuse. And there are services that we provide. Um, it includes uh, interpreting service, um, uh, NDI service for people living with disability. Um, and we, we just became an NDIS provider. Um, and uh, we have a case management uh, and case worker that works with refugees. So that is the other part we started uh, in 2021, since the fall of Kabul and uh, crisis in Ukraine, we started becoming um, a refugee lead organization, so providing support to refugees to resettle in Australia. We resettled over 3,000 refugees in partnership with AIMS Australia. Uh, our charitable uh, organizations partner, such as Rotary Club, Young Disability, Trade Together, uh, St. Vincent de Paul, and there are a number of other charities who supported us during this, this journey. We have a special focus on short-term and long-term needs of the community. The short-term was the immediate needs of refugees to be resettled, and the long-term vision is to integrate them into Australian society. So this is a brief introduction that I can give uh, about BASA, but you know, if you have any other questions, I will happily answer that. Oh, no, I have no question, but just a comment. Wow, to both of you. I think uh, the work that you do is incredible. And I think a lot of people don't know how many different services and what kind of challenges you encounter. And I think Francis already mentioned uh, the workforce, uh, but I'm wondering, Basia, whether for your organization challenges are different. <laughs> Bashir, I think uh, one of the questions would be, what are the main challenges that the organization face? Uh, our organization, or uh, it is just... Um... Bakhtar. Oh, Bakhtar. Oh, you <laughs> <want to know? laughs> well, there are heaps of challenges um, uh, that, 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 that we can face in a day, um, uh, such as, you know... Um, dealing with a diverse community groups, uh, especially in the Afghan community, connecting them with the diverse communities. In the morning when we go to the office, so we have volunteers and we have staff who are um, uh, taking inquiries and responding to communities' um, uh, questions. Um, there are a number of needs. I mean, there are a number of demands for money services in the community. And as a community organization, people think that we do everything for them. Uh, but sometimes it's not true. We try to do everything, but as a community organization, we have a responsibility to connect them to the services. That's all we can do. And there are services that we provide ourselves. So, um, yeah, well, uh, there are challenges and it's exciting that we overcome the challenges and at the same time, educate the community, connect them to the services and provide them the opportunity to, um, to become independent and find their ways themselves. Thanks, Bessie, and that was me just dying. Sorry, I'm recovering from a throat infection. So uh, the question for me was, from me was whether um, challenges that your organization that was established in 2017, which is a little bit newer, are quite significantly different than a more established organization such as uh, Francis. But you've answered that um, really well. And Francie, what about you, apart from the constant uh, funding um, issues, I guess, um, and also workforce challenging challenges. Is there anything else you wanted to share with us about what may, maybe some of the other challenges are? Uh, unmuting myself helps uh -huh. a bit, yes. Well <laughs> uh, I was uh, thinking about the, the questions, Eva. Uh, uh, what do community organizations do? And this is a this is a question that I often ask uh, new staff at X. Like, why why does X exist? You know, why why are we here? What is our purpose? And you know, I I get all sorts of answers to provide these services, to provide those services, and all that. The bottom line is, and I always say it is improve life, improving lives through care in our instance, you know, regardless of what we do, you know, what program area we have, if we have improved someone's lives through care that we provide, 
then we have achieved our, our goal. We've achieved our mission. So uh, it's challenging. It's hard. We, we are currently experiencing a, a COVID outbreak that we haven't had throughout the, you know, the COVID era. Uh, we have you know, 10, 10 staff off not related, but, you know, we just happen to have COVID. So we are short staff, we are understaffed and it's not easy, but we will get through it. You know, we got through things before we will get through it before. So um, again, improving lives of others through care is, you know, is, is our main purpose, why we are here and why we want to be here for many more years to come. And that's my message. Yeah. Um, and Francie and Bulia uh, and Abasia, sorry, we're going to be talking about in a minute about um, the needs of a, of a community and how to determine them. But my question to both of you, um, and you can take it, Abasia, first, is are the expectations from within the community high? Are they difficult to, to meet? Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are high. They are high. They are. As Basia mentioned earlier, people expect everything. You know, they, they, uh, many times they're not realistic as to what, what can be, you know, what can be done. And they think because we are Croatian that we can do everything. No, we can't. You know, we need to go by the guidelines and we do go by the guidelines. And our, uh, you know, an amazing result at a quality, recent quality review is the testimony to that. You know, we, we go by, by the book and we have to go by the book. We need to protect people, our staff mm -hmm. and, and our consumers. You know, rules are there for a reason. Guidelines are there for a reason. So uh, it is a constant education for one of the better word, you know, to tell people, you know, what can be done and what can't be done and how to and negotiating, negotiating with it. They, they, have a, they have home care packages program, for example, and then they expect that uh, everything under the sun can be provided for under the program, but it can't. There are inclusions, there are exclusions. So it's, a, like I said, a constant education. We, we are big on it. Uh, I myself am a teacher by trade, so that is kind of natural to me to educate and informed so we we have we run uh, quarterly newsletters very lengthy ones to consumers bilingual where we explain all sorts of things i uh, i mentioned the family family online family forums in my slides so we believe the more knowledge people have the more information current and updated information they have there will be less difficulties you know throughout their their journey in hk yeah Thank you, Francie. And uh, Basia, you've already mentioned, I guess, um, that uh, the community that you serve is very diverse. People often assume that it's, you know, everybody speaks the same language. They all practice the same religion, but it's not the case. So you've had to navigate some of the uh, community expectations. And you, you mentioned that you made the organization completely secular. Could you tell us why um, you made that decision? Um, is it to make the community more inclusive or what was the rationale? Well, as you are aware, back home in Afghanistan, um, I think uh, that conflict that is going on is based on um, religion conflict and as well as um, political ideology. So people often get in fight and argument um, over um, political opinions and religious. Even in here, before um, establishing Bata, I was working with other community organizations which were representing a specific ethnicity um, at that time, I could, I could tell that they are not growing. And the reason was because they were stuck somewhere with a conflict and they were trying to, um, trying to put down another organization or another community group uh, is because they're, they have different belief or they have different um, political ideology. So based on those findings and based on those, what I've experienced in the community, I, with a few other people, we came together to establish something that can be inclusive for the community where all people can see themselves within the organization. So the normal community members, they don't care what people, um, uh, people's political ideology is or what people think about the religion. They only need support. They only want to be supported and helped in the community and to be included and to uh, imagine a bright future for their children. 
So that's what we are trying to build for the community. And we are very much focused on the next generation. So the next generation needs to be aware of all these, these conflicts. We cannot bring the conflict what's happening in Afghanistan and Australia. So in here, we have been given a second opportunity, um, a second chance, and we need to take it and we need to use it towards a bright future. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you, Basia and Francie. Um, since 1982, when the organization really started, um, you've had to kind of roll with the punches as well because there was a few things that happened. Um, you know, for example, in 1990s, early 1990s, there was an influx of refugees from your part of the world. How do you stay relevant? How do you um, make sure that those community needs can be um, as much as possible met? Um, when you designed uh, programs uh, or when you seek funding, how do you stay relevant um, in this ever-changing world? Uh, not easy, but uh, uh, listen. look, listening to the needs in the community, like I said at the very start of the presentation, the reason we are still here and thriving is that uh, we have changed and adapted uh, as the community needs change. And uh, as you said initially, it was more about settlement services, you know, people arriving, influx, you know, of uh, uh, newly arrived migrations and then, you know, settling them in and uh, assisting them to, um, you know, to become a part of, a, of an Australian life. And uh, uh, we have had uh, different funding streams uh, throughout throughout the history i would say uh but uh, lately in the last in the last 10 years 10 12 years we are mostly focused on hk because our community is uh, is aging and this is where the need is uh, absolutely great uh not all it's not always possible to meet the community needs uh we all know how uh, funding process goes. You know, you apply for all sorts of funding. It, it's the matter of whether you're getting it or not. Only when, um, I'll give you an example, only when um, the the aged care, where home care packages system changed back in 2017, we were able to grow enormously. Up until then, uh, or provide approved providers like us, uh, were applying for packages for a for a certain number of packages every twelve to eighteen months when the grant is open and uh, up until twenty seventeen we uh, we only had we were only able to source forty five home care packages. Well, like year after year, we were not successful in in getting more. Uh, once they. Um, uh, got rid of those barriers once the clients actually the people uh, had uh, or had the right to themselves choose the provider we have grown you know what i mean so now we have uh, 260 something yeah and growing and we we could have uh, another 100 more if we have enough workforce so that tells you you know the discrepancy so there is a a bit of a disconnect between the needs and available services. It's not always possible to meet all of it. Yeah. Because we are just a little bit behind in terms of what the community expectations are and, um, you know, it's sort of like a supply and demand. And I think when we plan for services, um, often um, it is things like um, shortages of workers, um, that come in the way, like we might have um, the greatest plans that might even have the money for it. But Correct. The, the issues with, um, you know, being able to supply the services that we want to supply. So we do um, have about seven minutes for questions. Um, and we're going to hand over to Angelo um, to ask them. But before I do that, Basia, why are you so passionate about your community? Like what's driving you? Um, how did you get into it? And like, what what is the um, the fire that's burning? Mm -hmm. Oh well, um, everybody has this question. Um, well, I've always been involved in the community. It um, it came from my mom. My mom was a um, woman advocate for forty years in Afghanistan until the fall of Afghanistan, and she and now she came to Australia. 
So she has been my mentor and um, uh, she is the one that I learned everything and she has been my role model all my life. And um, I've been doing this community work for, for a while, maybe over 20 years. Um, and also my um, education background uh, in linguistics. Um, so I did, I did linguistics in France, um, literature, which is more of to do with cultures, languages, being involved in the community, meeting people, um, learning about cultures, languages. This has been something um, within me and I've been passionate about it. So when I came to Australia, and Australia provides all the opportunity and multicultural country, I mean, um, I'll call it continent. Now, uh, being in Melbourne and Victoria, the most diverse state, I had the opportunity to, to do whatever I wanted to do in the community to embrace all those um, diversity and uh, get involved with people, connecting them with our diverse community. So yeah, that's why I'm very passionate. Um, this is a volunteer work that I do, and I will keep doing it until I until I breathe. And until maybe um, that we've developed um, leaders that can help us, right? Because I often think about what's going to happen with with me uh, when I'm 95 and no longer uh, running color, right? And Francie, you too, you wear quite a few different hats, um, including um, translator and a teacher. What's driving Francie? How come you're still around and so passionate about things? Uh, th that's me. I can't be any different. So mm -hmm. uh, as you said, the, the background, uh, I am a teacher, so I'm very, very much people oriented. I also spent, I also spent the nine years uh, uh, in radio as a producer. And uh, as you said, Nati, interpreter and translator, so now community, you know, community worker and uh, advocate for others. So th this is just me. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm at the right place, I believe. Yeah, it's, I can't do anything else. I don't want to do anything else. Yeah, well, that, what, what do they say? If you um, love your job, you don't ever have to go to work um, or something like that. But we're very grateful to both of you uh, for doing this work and also coming um, and sharing your uh, experiences with us. Angelo, over to you for questions. We have about five minutes. Yeah, so we've, we've got about three questions, so we'll just go through them. Um, so the first one, we will start with Basia. Um, how do you measure the success of your work? Mm -hmm. um, well, the, I believe determining the needs of a community involves a process of assessment and engagement together with relevant information and insights. So that's, that's the way you can measure the success of your project or activities that you do is through surveys and questionnaires. Uh, for example, conducting surveys and questionnaires is, is, a, is, a, is an effective way to collect data from a wide range of community members. Um, I believe interviews and focus groups that also um, provide an insight about whatever activity we do in the community. Uh, community meetings, that is an important part uh, to consider uh, when measuring the success of um, um, a project. And um, assessing the collaboration we had with our stakeholders, their opinion, feedback, suggestions, all those things um, can provide an insight about the success of a project or activity that we do in the community. No, amazing. Thank you so much, Basia. Um, the next question, th this one's just a bit of a shorter one, but it's for Francie. Um, do all staff at the ACCS speak Croatian? No, not all of them, no. Uh, majority are, but not all of them. We have, uh, oh, how many would, this, would I say, around 10, 11 that, are, that don't speak the language. We welcome everyone. Not all our clients are Croatians. So uh, there is, yeah. There is no need. Look, uh, uh, we welcome uh, bilingual people because there are, you know, people that value uh, value a staff member who speaks a language other than English. But we are we are happy to uh, engage everyone. No, amazing. Um, yeah, no, thank you. This is also a bit of a follow on question, and you sort of did answer it. But who who is your uh, community organization specifically for? We um. We, uh, we are called Australian Creation Community Services. This is how the founders, you know, of the organization na named it. Uh, 
we are becoming more and more multicultural. Like I said, the the bulk of uh, uh, clients is from uh, is uh, Croatian speaking. We also have clients from other parts of Europe, a lot. Uh, we also have Egyptians as well. Funny enough, you know, people hear from one another, and you know, you uh, I want what you have, kind of thing. You know, my neighbor has uh, service through you. How about us? Things like that. So. Uh, we we welcome you know we welcome everyone we are we are here and we'd like to be here to meet to meet people's needs if we can and we can only do that with um, with the right uh, staff set so uh, and look for this work I'd say caring caring is my number one uh, you know number one criteria for employment if 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 you don't know something at this point in time you will learn it. You know, but if you don't, you need to have that caring culture. People, people care how much you care, if you know what I mean by that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Thank you, Francie. Um, yeah, and just Bassia, if you've got anything to add, like who is your community organization for broad range of people as well, or is it more mm -hmm. specialized? Well, um, it started, um, well, how we started was basically for the Afghan community to bring all the ethnicities under one umbrella. And after achieving that, um, we believe that now we are uh, more of a community, multicultural organizations that we do not discriminate. So we help whoever knocks our door. Um, it's a more of a multicultural, as Francis said. Uh, we are also very much helping everyone. So since the fall of Kabul, we supported the uh, refugees from Afghanistan. And then the crisis in Ukraine, we started supporting the Ukrainians. And now we are supporting um, all other communities like Bangladesh, Sri Lankan, Indian, Pakistani, all of them. And whoever come, um, comes to us, we, we, we support them. Amazing. Thanks so much. Um, guys, with that, we will wrap up. Um, it, it's been absolutely wonderful to have you both here with us today. Um, and I just, I will pass it on to Eva, but just before I go, please, yeah, do do um, chuck us a follow on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook and obviously YouTube where this one's being live streamed. Um, thank you so much, Basia, Francie, Carla and thank Eva you. and you. Stephanie um, for everything you guys have done for us and Francie, wonderful presentation. Um, Eva, yeah, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Um, look, I, I do feel very inspired um, and I think our communities are in very good hands with people like Francie and Basia and um there are, of course, in Australia, many, many, many other organizations that support us. It is a volunteer week. Uh, for some of us, um, this work is volunteer. For other people, uh, this is paid work. But I think behind the scenes of every organization, um, there are volunteers with good heart um, that contribute. So uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank everyone that does volunteer in any capacity at all. Uh, but also a massive thank you to Francie and Basia for coming and um, telling us about what they do. Um, I'm sure that they'll be happy um, if people reached out, um, particularly for Francie. We bumped into each other after some years, you know, and, yes. then, and she said to me, oh, my God, I'm desperate for workers. Um, and um, look, it is a great career path uh, if you care, if you love this sort of work. And um, it's, you know, quite well paid. And we do want to build, as Basia said, um, the next generation of leaders who understand, who care, so that when I retire, um, I'm looked after. Um, and for that, Francie and Basia, thank you very much for coming and sharing um, your stories with us, which are very inspirational. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Carla. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Bye.